we welcome you, and I am excited to um, introduce our presenter today, Claire Bradley. Claire, take it away. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm delighted to be with you today. My name is Claire Bradley, and I'm a professional genealogist here in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, I was going to ask people to tell me where they are, but I am I can already see that. I'm really overwhelmed with how many people there are and all over the world. And uh, it's amazing to see uh, so many people here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Hope you can all see that. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be hopping between my presentation in PowerPoint and uh, live demoing on the browser. So um, that will be what's happening. So let me just share this now. And before we get started, I just want to display the disclaimer for uh, Roots Check, which obviously relates to when it is a recording later on rather than the live version now. Um, all right. So the Cambridge Online Dictionary uh, defines a scavenger hunt as a game in which people must collect a number of items in a given period of time without buying them. And I thought that that was a really good description of Irish genealogy because it's very much like a scavenger hunt, it, particularly in the virtual space these days, but also in person at repositories. You're jumping between different websites, you're collecting material here and there, and you're combining it to get to the next level. So it really is like a game. And the Irish state is very much aware of our huge diaspora population. 80 million people worldwide claim Irish descent. Uh, and to put that in perspective, we have 5 million people in the Republic of Ireland and just about 1.5 in Northern Ireland. So a vast number of times more people claiming descent from Ireland than actually live in Ireland today. Statistics have shown that Americans in particular are more likely to identify with their Irish ancestors than with other nationalities who may be more prevalent in their trees. But because of this, many Irish records have been made available freely online without even requiring a registration to use the website. And it was those records in particular that I wanted to show you today. Uh, now, obviously, there are many Irish records on Ancestry, on Family Search, and on Find My Past, but we're not really going to be focusing on those records today. It's the other ones which you may not be aware of. Sometimes we get a little bogged down in what's on a commercial site that we have subscribed to. Um, so you should already have the handout, but at these, it, this is the uh, websites that I've asked you to have ready open in your browser. Um, now, I should say that um, I'm lucky enough to be using two screens here today. Now, if you're watching one, you might prefer to just see me demonstrate what I'm going to do rather than try to do it yourself at the same time, because it can be hard to flip between uh, a Zoom or a, a, a watching uh, browser and then other links. But if you want to play along, you're most welcome to do so. Um, I also know that one of the websites, this um, Griffiths Valuation on Ask About Ireland, um, is a little problematic in Safari if you're using a Mac or an iPhone or an iPad. So you might try to open a Chrome or something else if you're going to look at that website in particular. So what I've chosen to do today is take you back through um, a particular branch of my own family tree. Um, and just before I go on to my next slide, I'll just point out that I had asked you to open these Find My Past links, but they're actually not going to be necessary, and I will explain why later on. So this, this lady is my great-grandmother, and her name was Mary Cullen. She was known as May, and she came from a large Catholic family who lived in the north city centre of Dublin, which is the capital city of Ireland. She was born in 1890, and she married a man called Frederick Walters in 1912. She had nine children. And she died in 1976, so a very long life for, for that period of time. So our first challenge today is going to be to find her family on the 1911 census. Now let me go to the census. So if you haven't ever seen the census website before, I want to show it to you now. And uh, this is a freely available website. Uh, you have the link and this is the main search box. But many people don't know that there's actually an advanced search box right here. It's not terribly obvious as a hyperlink, but uh, just to show you, there it is there. Now, um, 
when you're searching for someone on this website, there's a couple of points that you need to remember. Um, it doesn't have what we call a sound X function. So if there are variants in a way a surname is spelt, as there might well be, although not in this case particularly, um, you need to search all the different variants of that name. Um, I've got two hints for you to try and identify this family. Mary Cullen will be a very common name, so I don't suggest that you try her name initially. But my hints are that the mother in this family had 17 children. Now, not all of them were alive in 1911, but she had 17 children. So if you see over here in this little box, there is a section where they asked married ladies how many children they had born alive and how many of them were still living. So there's a hint for you in, in, in looking for what we want. The second hint is that this family lived on a street associated with an important civic function in a town or city. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm just at the end of a cold, which was terrible timing. So let me know if you manage to figure out who I'm talking about. We know they're a family called Cullen and the mother has 17 children and they live on a street that has something to do with a civic function. <coughs> I'm going to give you a minute and then I'm going to bring up the answer myself. Now, I've done that search there and I did it countrywide. And it turns out that there are two women in 1911 who had 17 children. But this is the lady we're interested in. And she lives on a street called Old Mayor Street. That was my hint, an important civic function. We have a Lord Mayor in Dublin. So let's click on her. You may or may not be aware <clears throat> that our only complete censuses in Ireland are for 1901 and 1911. Our 19th century censuses were mostly destroyed in a fire in our public records office in 1922. So the anniversary, the centenary is just coming up in a couple of months time. There are some fragments available of the earlier census website, the censuses, and they are on this site too. But today we're focusing on the main uh, extant records. So hopefully by now you will have identified this same family as I have. And there's my great grandmother there as a 19 year old woman and um, she's not yet married and she's living with her parents. Now, the North Docks area of Dublin City is completely changed now from 110 years ago. The, today, the light rail network called the Lewis runs through Mare Street, which is in the IFSC, the financial district of Dublin City. So this is a transcript. In a moment, we'll look at the actual image. But if you click this little box, show all information, it actually transcribes out the whole sent the whole section for each return. And we see that we have got a family called uh, Cullen, headed by Michael and Anne. And there's a couple of important things to point out here. Um, if we look at Mrs. Anne Cullen, we'll see that she is a 53 year old woman from County Carlow, although she now lives in Dublin. That's gonna be important later on. And over, if we go across, we see that she says, and I, I highlight that she says it, it's not necessarily correct. She's been married for 37 years, and that she had 17 children born alive and nine of them are still alive. Now, unfortunately, those numbers are often different. Uh, when we look at these records, infant mortality was much higher in the past. And of course, there was a lot more poverty and difficulties with hygiene and so on. So it was very common, sadly, for people to not have all of their children alive by the time they reach their 50s. So there are five children here with the couple. Um, we've got some of their younger children, 17, 19 and 24. And then we've got a couple of older sons who are unmarried. Um, the 17 children, I have actually identified them all, but it took me many years um, because I didn't know what their names were. And it, eventually I was able to figure it out. I've got a blog post on my website about it. Um, so people are vague in the past about their ages and about dates. So when we look at these uh, ages, we have to allow a bit of wiggle room. She might be 53, she might be 52, she might be 56. Um, again, we, people did not have to be quite so precise in the past as they are today. They never needed to know exactly, it wasn't important. This, this question here, 
where she's asked how many years she's married. That might be the first time in her entire life that she was ever asked that question in a form. And um, she is presumably guessing about it as well. She's saying, oh, I think it's about 37 years. She's probably extrapolating from her 36 year old son there. She's probably saying, oh, John's my oldest child. And we were married before he was born. So I guess it's 37, but it, it's hard to imagine now that people wouldn't know this thing, but they really didn't. So our next challenge is to try and figure out what Anne's birth surname was. And we're gonna need that so that we can find their marriage. Now, if they have much less common names, we might just try giving it a go without their, um, uh, without knowing her birth name. But in this case, Michael and Anne are incredibly common names. So it could take us a while to try and find that marriage without her. So what we're gonna do now is we will go to Irish genealogy. And this is irishgenealogy.ie. Um, this is the home page. We're actually going to click straight onto the civil records section. In this note, note. Now, if the family we were looking at on the census had younger children, if they had been born between the two censuses of 1901 and 1911, we would have a little bit of a helping hand here because the mother's maiden name appears in the indexes for that period after 1900. Before 1900, they don't. And we have to employ other tools to try and find what we're looking for. Now, when you've got a common name like Cullen, you need to think a little bit cleverly. Um, even though my particular ancestor was called Mary, which is, of course, the most common name that women will have in Ireland in this time, um, there might well be a lot of people called Mary Cullen who were born in the 1890s in Dublin. So that's going to take a lot of time to go through all these records. So instead, we're going to try and find her brother, who was named on the census there as Edward Frank Cullen. And he's got two different names that we can look for. Uh, we don't know which one we're going to find him under. Um, and of course, he, Edward Cullen, there's a very famous Edward Cullen in Twilight. I have to admit that I have never found this particular man's death. So it may well be that he is actually the same Edward Cullen. So because he's got two different names, we're going to have to try and find him under one or the other. I don't know which one he's going to turn up as. So if you want to bring up Irish genealogy now, you can try this with me. Um, but I'm going to demo it for you because there's a couple of things that you might not expect to find. So um, he said in 1911 that he was 17. So that gives us an approximate birth year of 1894. But I'm going to widen that out to um, three years on either side, just in case. And you notice I'm not putting a first name in the box there. And that's because I don't know which name I'm going to find him under. So I want to bring up a list of everybody and then I'll do a find on the page. So this is something where I feel people might make a mistake uh, easily. And I'm asking uh, David to put a link into the chat now to a, a website which will have a list of registration districts for Ireland. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because when you type, it comes up with options. And in this case, we want Dublin, so that's okay. There are different registration districts in Dublin, but if I put Dublin in, it will come up with all of them. However, if I typed in Cork, then you might think that's going to give me everybody in County Cork you would be wrong. There are multiple registration districts in Cork's uh, county. And this one, which is called Cork, would only give you the ones that are in that particular registration district. So it's an easy mistake to make because some of the names are the same as the county. So in this case, I'm putting in Dublin. But if you were looking for someone else and you didn't know what the registration districts were for that particular county, we use the website that's in the chat now to uh, get a list of all of the uh, registration districts by county, which is very helpful. I'm going to tick birth and I'm going to put in my years 1891 to 1897. Now when I click search, first of all it's going to ask me to confirm I'm not a robot, which I am not. And then it's going to ask me to put my name in this box. Now you can put anything you like in this box, you can put Mickey Mouse, anything, it doesn't matter. It's just a ticky box that they have to do for some civil servant reason. So I usually just put any random letters that I type on the keyboard, tick the box and that's it. Now don't panic. 
319 results. We're not going to be worried about that. Now, if you remember, we saw that this family lived on the north side of the city. So straight away, we can eliminate all of these people who live in this Dublin South. The Dublin city, if you don't know, is divided by a river called the Liffey. And um, they, there is a fierce um, rivalry between the, the north side and the south side. And so this family are north siders. <clears throat> we still have 132 hits um, and they go over two pages. We're getting 100 results per page. So we might need to check onto the second page to look for. Now, if you're not familiar, um, you can do a control and F on your keyboard to bring up a search box. And I'm going to type in Edward. And there's nothing on this page for Edward. Great. Now, I'm going to go to the next page just to be sure. Um, that's doing a funny thing, isn't it? I'm going to try Edward again there. Okay, now here we've got an Edward Cullen. He was born in 1892, so it's not exactly the same year as we we're interested in. But as I said, people were a bit vague about their ages in the past. But we'll need to click on it to assess the information. And here you're going to think about what you already have collected in uh, the first website. We know that his parents are called Michael and Anne. And I'll give you a little hint that we also, I also know that this, uh, this brother of my ancestor was born on the same street as they lived on in the census. So we're expecting to see Mayor Street or something like it. So we click on the image. And it actually brings us up a whole page of um, the births register for Dublin for this period. Um, so we need to scroll down the page until we see Edward. And there he is there. And we can see straight away that he's not the guy we're looking for because this guy's parents are called Gerald and Mary Ann. So we can, we can go ahead and abandon him. We'll come back to the actual information when we find the right person now in a second. So we had uh, checked for Edward and he wasn't there. So let's now check for Frank or Francis, which would be the uh, full version of Frank. And there's a Francis there, and it's telling me this is the only Francis in this page. So we're going to take a look at him. And we see again the whole page. This time the handwriting is different, and it's a little bit easier to read. The handwriting can be very variable. I always think it's funny because the people who were recording this were civil servants, and they knew that this information was being recorded for posterity, and yet some of them have terror. And here he is at the bottom of the page. But this looks like he's the right person, doesn't it? Because he's got Michael and Anne as his parents and he's living on Mayor Street. So I'm going to pop back over to my slideshow for a second and uh, we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. So I've just extracted out the information there. And we see that this person was called Francis. So there's no hint of the Edward there that he seems to be using on the census. Um, so maybe Edward is a baptismal name, um, which we're not going to look at today. Um, and he was born on the 12th of August at 5 Upper Mare Street. So notice that it's a very slightly different address. Now, it may be that they renumbered the houses as Mayor Street grew over time. Or it may be that the family actually lived at a different address on the same street um, in 1893. Uh, people hadn't got much security of tenure in the past and they frequently moved around. And uh, particularly with a family like this, with so many people, they might have needed more space. Um, but this is him uh, and his parents are Michael Cullen and Anne Rourke. So for the first time, we're getting Anne's birth surname. And you'll always get the birth surname of a mother on a birth certificate for any of her children. So that is a nice triangulation point between this and the census. And we see that Michael was a labourer. And the other interesting point here is that Anne is not able to read and write. Do you see here? It says her mark. And that's how they indicated on these records, which were filled in by a clerk after the fact that the person who was registering the birth wasn't able to read or write. And that's an important point. Rourke is one of the most common surname, uh, most variably spelt names in Ireland. Uh, we've got here in its, its most common format, R-O-U-R-K-E. 
Um, but you also would see that with an O apostrophe, O'Rourke. And in the past, we would consider O'Rourke and Rourke to be the same surname. So that's very important. If you have a surname today that has or could have an O or a Mac in front of it, when you're looking in the past for your Irish ancestors, you always need to check with the O and the Mac and without the O and the Mac, because people swapped with impunity between the versions with and out, without. But Rourke also has a lot of different spellings. And here, because Anne herself is illiterate, we don't know what version uh, she would have used or what her family would have used because she went in, she said, my name was Anne Rourke and the clerk wrote that down in his particular, whatever way he wanted to spell that. Of course, it would always be a man at that point. Um, so when we look for Anne in other records, we need to consider other spellings of Rourke as well. <clears throat> So that's the next step is to now find Michael and Anne's marriage details. Now we're going to do the same, we're going to do it on the same website. We're going to go back to uh, Irish genealogy, which is here. And I'm going to show you a little trick. So in this case, we'll start a fresh search, but this time we're going to go to this more search options. But this is a quick way to find something where you already know a bit more about the information. And it's also here that if you knew the birth surname of a couple, um, you could try and find their children by putting in the surname of the man and then the surname of the woman and narrowing it down by years and registration district. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use it to try and find Michael and Anne's marriage in the same way. Now, you may remember that we noted on the census that Anne uh, said she came from County Carlow, which is a Midlands county in Ireland. And she probably would have migrated for work reasons from there, which is an agricultural region, to Dublin, probably before she got married, but perhaps not. So in this case, we don't actually know whether the marriage between this couple took place in Dublin or in Carlow or perhaps somewhere else entirely. Um, so again, we might limit our registration district. We wouldn't want to limit it because we don't want to say, oh, it's definitely Dublin. Oh, it's definitely Carlo. If they could have for some reason gotten married in Cork. We don't know yet. Um, so we said as well, 37 years was what was on the census. Now, I'm famously bad at maths, um, but 37 years gives us. Um, sorry, let me go on to my notes. Um, let's try. It's probably going to be sometime in the 1870s, right? So let's try 1870 to 1875 and see what we get. Now, I didn't put any first names in there just to show you that sometimes people, again, could be under a different name. But it looks like this is the right people, doesn't it? Um, and, but what's interesting here is we said 37 years. That would have given us 1874. But this is 1870, a full four years before uh, what Anne indicated. But let's just see if it looks like the right people. So this again just gives us the same summary itemized out. And we're going to click on our image. And just like on the births, you get extra people on the page who are not who you're interested in. And this is actually our guys here. But there's four sets of couples on the page. I'm going to go back to my slideshow to show you the next step. OK, so what we get here is a marriage certificate. This is a civil marriage certificate recognized by the state. And it says that it took place in the Church of St. Lawrence uh, in the uh, north side of Dublin on the 3rd of August, 1870. So in fact, by the time of the 1911 census, they were married almost 40 years. And the couple here are called Michael Cullen and Anne Rourke. And I want you to notice something straight away. Do you see here that Rourke is spelt R-O-U-R-K-E, like we saw before, but over here on her dad's name, there's no U, R-O-R-K-E. Now, probably the clerk there has just made a mistake because again, we know that Anne um, 
said she was illiterate on the previous uh, record. So uh, she probably wasn't doing anything other than verbally supplying this information. But notice here that it doesn't say that she was illiterate. And normally on a marriage certificate, if the person said they were illiterate, it would have the her mark, his mark uh, symbol there as well. So it may be a case that Anne actually was able to read and write, but that she wasn't very confident about it. And that would be quite common for people who came from a rural background. And maybe they did attend school, which was compulsory, but they didn't go all the time or they left quite young. And maybe they only had the most rudimentary skills for reading and writing. Um, the other thing to note here is this, this differentiation on the ages. So Michael says he's a full age. Well, that's a funny age, isn't it? It means that he's 21 or older, but it could mean anything at all. I've seen a marriage certificate where someone said they were a full age, but they were 59 and a grandfather who is a subsequent marriage. Um, but here Anne has said she's 19, which is a nice specific age. So she's under the age of majority at this point. And then we get some other information about them. We get where they lived when they were married and they're both living in Dublin. So she's obviously come to Dublin to work and she's met Michael and they've gotten married and she's a servant and he's a labourer. And they're living both of these addresses at uh, 2 Brady's Cottage, Newfoundland Street and 2 Emily Place, very near Mayor Street. They're in the same area precisely. Um, and for both of them, then we get the names of their dads. Later on, marriage certificates also add the names of mothers, but not until the 1956. And um, so in this period, the civil record only shows the dad's name. And so we get a, for Anne, who is the person we're going to focus on, we get Hugh Rourke, and it says that he's a labourer. And um, so, so presumably some kind of agricultural labourer, but we don't know precisely what. And uh, the other thing you would like to note when you're looking at um, a marriage is who are the witnesses? The witnesses are often people who are related to the couple who are getting married. Just like today, you might pick a, a brother or sister or a very close friend. Um, they did in the past as well. But in this case, I don't recognize either of those surnames, Dowling and Richards. But you should still note them just in case they are someone who is a married sister of the couple um, who just has obviously now got a different surname. So this is our civil marriage, but there is also a second copy of the marriage available to us, and that is the church's copy of the marriage. Now, it's not always possible to get this second copy. The church might have lost the records or um, they might have been destroyed by a uh, fire or a flood or in a move lost. But in this case, we hopefully will be able to find the marriage record. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare it. The Catholic Church often shows extra information on their marriage records. And we might get something like the name of the mothers, which would again help us triangulate with other records. So you can see what I mean by scavenger hunt, that here um, we're hopping around between different websites to try and find what we're looking for. We're going to go to the National Library's website now, which is another free website. I'm showing you this for a number of reasons. It's an images only website, so there are no transcriptions of this site. And it was here that I was going to direct you to find my past, to look for the marriage record. But when I went to replicate that search myself, I couldn't find them. And I knew that they were there. Um, and I enlisted the help of a very clever friend and she actually found them for me. And it was, without a doubt, the worst mistranscription I have ever seen of a record on Find My Past. I've reported it as an error, but it's so bad that I'm not even going to show it to you today. But luckily for us, we can just look at the image and because we already have the precise date of the marriage and the name of the church, we'll be able to find it quite easily. So uh, have a go now. You'll want to find the name of the church on the marriage certificate and you'll want to find the uh, precise date of the marriage. While you're having a go at that, I'm just going to show you that down here, there's a lovely map of Ireland. Um, here's Dublin here and uh, here's Carlo, in case you're wondering where it is. Um, so if I zoom in, um, I'm not going to zoom in on Dublin because it's an urban uh, city, but I'm just going to show you what it looks like uh, for Wicklow. Um, so we zoom in and it shows us all of the Catholic parishes for the county and it shows them with their with their boundaries. And why is this important? Is if you had some people and they lived in this Roundwood parish, perhaps they live here in Roundwood and maybe there's a church just over the parish boundaries in Enniskerry. And now those people are nominally belonging to the Roundwood Parish. But in the past, people don't have cars, they maybe don't have horses, they're walking to the church when they need to go there. So they're going to go to the nearest church that's available to them. And it 
they won't care that it's over the parish boundary. So if you're looking for your ancestors in Roundwood and you can't find them, well, you need to check in the parishes surrounding them to see, well, maybe they've just moved a little bit. Maybe they're in the, the parish next door. For Dublin, it's a little bit different because it was an urban centre. People were moving around all the time. And you might find that a family, a large family like the Cullens, had multiple children. They were baptised in different churches as they moved around in a particular area. So you can see when we get to the city centre, it's got all these little crosses highlighted in there for us. And if I zoom in a bit more, it starts to bring them up for us. And we're looking for St. Lawrence, isn't that right? There it is there, St. Lawrence O'Toole is a famous martyr. And when I highlight that, straight away, it brings me up a couple of pieces of information that would be important, perhaps. It tells us that it's in the Archdiocese of Dublin. So that's the religious region that it's grouped into. Now, that might be important if you had a place name, for example, like Black Rock, where there's more than one Black Rock in Ireland, there's more than one Newcastle in Ireland. So you would need to identify in advance which, um, which diocese the place that you're interested is in. So you don't want to be looking in the diocese that's over there, that's the wrong place. And that website where you found the townland, uh, the registration districts, that also has a good uh, map, uh, sorry, a good database to explain that to you as well. So when I click in here, we also see that there are a couple of other names for this parish, and that might be useful, particularly if your ancestors are abroad. Uh, now uh, and they they're referring back to somewhere when from when they lived in Ireland they might use a different place name than you recognize today so this site will give you a really good rundown and, and for some of the parishes you'd be quite surprised at how many different name variants there would be and it's not just necessarily like in this case where it's naming the street that the church is on several place it might be an entirely different name for it um now you're probably wondering why this says the word microfilm. Um, our, our good friends, the Mormons, did this microfilming in the National Library in the 1950s. And they, they made a deal with the uh, Catholic Church and the Catholic Church for each parish in the country sent their records to the National Library where they were microfilmed. And uh, the National Library was left with a copy and there was then a copy taken to um, Salt Lake City on microfilm as well. And when the National Library decided to digitize these records, they just kept the terminology of the microfilms. So before this went online, I would have regularly gone in and looked on a microfilm um, at these records. And believe me, it's a whole lot easier to look at them now. But you can see that there are uh, baptisms and marriages. The Catholic Church tends not to keep uh, burial records, so you're not going to find burials here. But I want to point out to you here that there's a couple of little gaps in these records. Um, so you can see here that this record goes from 1853 to the 4th of June, 1875. And the next baptism record begins a few days later. Now, it might be that there were no children baptized in those three days, or it might be that they've lost some records. Other uh, parish websites, you'll see much larger gaps in the records. And sometimes they will have clearly lost something, entire books of records gone. Um, these records, generally speaking, all cut off at about 1880, 1881. Um, so oh. what I was saying was that there are microfilm records and they're now digitized, but there are no image. They're just images. They're not transcriptions. Um, there are transcriptions of those records and they are on both Ancestry and Find My Past. Um, they collaborated to transcribe those records in very very quick time, about three months it took them. And uh, some people would say that the uh, transcriptions are not particularly good. And certainly today, I found that to be the case when I looked at this particular marriage, but most of the time they're just fine. And of course the gold standard is always that you have a transcription and then you have an image so that you can check for yourself that the person has transcribed it correctly. So um, we're gonna look now at the, uh, the, the actual image once, uh, once we're back in business. Uh, so Mary asked me about an Anne Gibson who was born in Belfast in 1812. Uh, her father was Robert and they arrived in the US in 1830. That's all we know. 
So that is right at the period, Mary, that's going to find, make it very difficult for um, us to find her because Catholic records really only kick off about in the 1820s when the penal laws began to be relaxed. Now, I, you haven't said there whether Anne is a Catholic or uh, a Protestant, but um, the records in general uh, for Northern Ireland, you want to have a look at the PRONI website, which is the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and they will be able to possibly give you some pointers on what to do um, to try and find her. Passenger list, obviously, uh, you may well know that already uh, when she was, um, uh, where she came from. Wow, okay, there's a toughy question. An ancestor from the 1760s. First of all, I would say really impressed that you know the name of an Irish ancestor from the 1760s because it can be incredibly difficult to go before 1800. Um, there may not be anything in Ireland that can help you at that point. If your ancestor was already in the US at that stage or Canada, you might be better off focusing on the records there, like particularly in the original colonies. They have very good records. I, I've done some great work with people who were in Massachusetts and they were Irish. And the records in Massachusetts gave me much more information than the records in Ireland could. A bit about the availability of pre-1850 records. The, the problem is that the pre-1850, there's very little that's comprehensive for Ireland, and that is uh, for a couple of reasons, but largely because of the penal laws. Catholics weren't allowed to keep records, and so they didn't. And the vast majority of people in Ireland were Catholics at that point. Um, and they also weren't allowed to own their own land, so they don't appear in the land records. Um, if I will put the links up again. Um, okay, Presbyterian church records. Uh, you want to make a start with the uh, Presbyterian Historical Society of Ireland. Uh, they're your best source for uh, the details there. There's not a huge amount online for them. There are no Catholic death records available. Um, so obviously Catholics do appear in the civil records, but the civil records only uh, start in 1864, unfortunately. And you can get them on that Irish genealogy site that I was showing you earlier on. Okay, a uh, person asking me about how do you know if it's the right person? That, well, that is that is the uh, million dollar question, isn't it? Um, if someone came to Canada as O'Hegarty, it was later Hegarty. It's quite possible that they decided to anglicize their name a little bit to uh, fit in better. Um, so you really just have to look at all the records that you've got for them and try and say, yes, this is the same person. They've got the same wife's name. They've got the same occupation. They appear to be roughly the same age. Um, but you, you just need to look at all the possibilities. Um, there's a good website, which I'll put into the chat for finding the surname variants. John Grenham is a prominent Irish genealogist and he has a great website with a surname connection in it. OK, so I'm getting a lot of questions that are on the same theme, which is what do you do in the early 19th century? You've got people who have left Ireland and uh, you don't know where. Um, sometimes they say what county they came from. And I mean, unfortunately, this is why I've, I've called the session a scavenger hunt is because you're going to try and pick things that are not necessarily um, what you would hope for. Uh, now, there are some early 19th century records on the census website that I showed you earlier on. If you look in the top left hand corner, there's a word called genealogy, which doesn't look like a hyperlink, but it is a hyperlink. And there are some other earlier records on that section of the website, um, such as the tie the plotment books, which are records of taxes paid to the Church of Ireland. But they were very unpopular taxes, not least because most people were not in the Church of Ireland and they resented having to pay a tax to a church they weren't part of. And so not everybody appears in those records and they're just generally the head of the house. Um, the other records that might be helpful are not necessarily online at the moment. The Registry of Deeds, which is a, a record repository that dates from 1709 onwards, has land records for Ireland. Uh, they are in the process of digitising those records, but it's going to be a long time before they can uh, get them all out there. At the moment, you can search images only on family search for them, but you need to know who owned the land that the person might be renting from to try and find it. So that can be a challenge when you're just looking at images. 
Yeah, so uh, it's amazing. The same question over and over again in different formats. It's like, how do we find where in Ireland? It's, I know it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, <laughs> you can try in, in, in the country that they ended up in. You really need to exhaust all your resources there. So think about things like friendly societies. Think about um, bank records. Um, there's some good records for friendly societies on a couple of the different commercial websites. Um, you can another really important tool is newspaper obituaries because people often said in a newspaper obituary this person came from Toome County Galway in 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 the notice about their death and um, also a really good uh, uh, database to look at is the Boston Pilot Missing Friends database which was not just for people in Boston but it was a bit like a Craigslist where people say I'm looking for so and so can you see my screen yes brilliant yes. Okay, okay, where were we? We were looking at the uh, records here and we were gonna try and find Anne and Michael's um, marriage. So we're gonna go to this marriage section and it brings it up just like it would if you were looking at it on a microfilm reader. Um, and it's black and white, of course, and that's just a brief image. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna filter it. So if you take a look here, um, you can select marriages now sometimes there are both baptisms and marriages in a book so that's why this is there in this case there's only marriages in this book and we want 1870 i think i was right um and we want august so i'm going to press apply and that brings me to the place in the book where august starts in these records which is great now St. Lawrence's records are a little bit blurry, as you can see, and that's all part of the fun of Irish genealogy. Some things are not perfect. Um, you can hear, I'm gonna blow up the image that we want in a minute to show you, but I just want to uh, highlight a couple of things. You can zoom it. Uh, the image goes across the page, so it's two pages of a book that you're gonna be looking at. Uh, you can print out or download the individual page. You can make it brighter, you can play with the contrast and you can also, this is particularly good when the writing is faint, you can flip it into negative. So sometimes that makes it easier to see if you aren't able to uh, find what you're looking for. But I have it here blown up already. So we're gonna take it here. And it is a little bit blurry, but I really wanted to use this particular one to show you because it was such an important find. And we've been talking a lot in the chat about, um, the the need to find a precise location in Ireland and this for me I'm not an emigrant I knew that this lady came from Carlo but I didn't know where in Carlo um, and this helped me find that information so the first thing it did was it actually gave me the mother's names as well now sometimes it gives you the mother's maiden names but in this case it just gave their first names so uh, for Anne Rourke her parents are called Hugh and Esther so that's helpful for us. And then here, this is very important. Um, it says where they lived in Carlow in 1870. It said Rathduff, Bagnallstown, County Carlow. And that's a really important find so that I can precisely date them to living in Carlow at that point. Now, it also tells me that these people are alive in 1870. Um, if they were dead, it would often just say dead in this column, or it might say it in Latin. Many of these church records are in Latin. And in fact, these records are in Latin. We can see that she's down as Anna, not Anne. And if you look here under uh, the husband's parents' names, it's down as Joannes and Maria Cullen instead of John and Mary. So armed with this particular information about the place in Carlo, we're now able to move out of Dublin and back into uh, Carlo to find Anne's family of origin. So I've got this nice map of Carlo for you to, to show you what it looks like, which I also took from that John Renham website um, with his kind permission. And here's what we know already about Anne's family. So we know that her father was called Hugh Rourke and that he was a labourer. And in 1870, when his daughter got married in Dublin, uh, he was living in somewhere called Rathduff, which is about here. Um, and it's not far from this town, which is pronounced, believe it or not, Lachlan Bridge, uh, not the way it looks at all. So um, we're going to look for Hugh in one of our most important census substitutes. And I said earlier on that we don't have the mid 19th century censuses. So um, what we use is something called 
the primary valuation of Ireland, which was a land taxation survey done um, between 1847 and 1864. It took a very long time to do it. And it was coordinated by a man called Sir Richard Griffith, which gives it its colloquial name, Griffith's valuation. And we use it all the time in genealogy. Uh, it covers the full scale of land holdings in rural Ireland, but it only gives the head of the household name. So you're not going to find, for example, Mrs. Esther Rourke on this census, on this record, unless her husband is dead. Um, it's much more useful for rural and farming ancestors than it is for city people, because city people might only be renting a room from someone and they might not be paying the rates or the tax on that property. Their landlord's probably paying it for them. So for a lot of people with urban ancestors, you're not gonna have much success with Griffith's valuation, but for rural people, it's really good. Um, now we're going to use, there's a number of places that you can look at Griffith's valuation. Uh, it's on all the big sites, Ancestry, Find My Past, it's on Family Search, but we're going to look at it on this Ask About Ireland site because again it's free and you don't have to have a login to use it. So I, I wanted to really focus on things that were directly accessible to you. But it's not a perfect site, it's a little bit buggy and I wanted to point out those bugs so that you know what you're getting when you go into it. Um, the first thing to say is that it also, this is the one that might be problematic in Safari. Um, so you might need to use Chrome or Firefox or something else. So we're going to do a search and what we're going to do is we're going to put in Rourke and that's the way we knew the name was spelt, but we're going to tick this include similar names so that it'll give us other versions of Rourke as well. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to put in Q and I'm going to select the county. Now when I select the county, watch the website closely, it does a little bit of a jump. And you see that it has now expanded out these boxes here. And if I wanted to select a particular area in a county, I could do that now. I could do it by selecting uh, the registration district, which are the unions, um, or I could select the civil parish. In this case, I'm, I'm not going to select anything. I just want to see everybody called Hugh Rourke in Carla. And I'm going to get four results. But the results are not in a particularly helpful format. Um, so this is the civil parish, which isn't going to be the same as the Roman Catholic parish. Um, and then I can get a transcription of the information, the original page and the map view. We're going to look at all of those one by one. So if we click on the details. Um, so this is a modern transcription of some of the information that's on the original record. Now, the original record is typewritten, so it, well, you won't have any difficulty reading it. But there is one important reason to look at this transcription first and it is this it tells you precisely when that information was published now, i mentioned earlier on that griffith's valuation covered 1847 to 1864 so it's a really big time frame and um so we want to know precisely when this information was recorded so here we see that carlo was done in 1852 just quite a long time before 1870 so it's also possible that these people may be moved in this time frame um, so let's just take a quick look at what this one says and then we'll, we'll go back to my PowerPoint and I'll show you the other ones. So this here is somebody called Hugh Rourke and he's renting from somebody called John Delaney in the townland of Lachlan Bridge. So it's, it's just up in the north uh, west corner of Carlo uh, <coughs> and that's all it gives me on this page. So I actually have to go on and look at the original page now to get the rest of the information. And we get the whole page then that covers uh, Lachlan Bridge. And I'm going to zoom up on it. Now, you can take some time yourself to look at these, at these headings, but uh, townland and occupier. So the occupier is the person who's in the property now or on the property now. And the immediate lesser is the person they're renting it from, but that might not be the person who owns it. They might be a middleman who's renting a larger plot and then dividing it up between people. Then we get a description of the, the property, a uh, description of tenements, it says, and it's usually something like this house, offices and land. And that will mean that they've got a house, they've got some outbuildings, you know, maybe a toilet, a shed, a barn, something to do with an animal and then land. Um, if there's something else like a garden, they'll they'll highlight that there or you see there there's a herd's house, for example. Um, so we're looking down this page and we're looking for Hugh Rourke and there he is. He's on plot 12B. 
It's important to note that number so that when you look at the map, you can find him on the map. Um, and we see here that he's just renting a house. It's just a house. There's no land with it. Um, so that's in the face of it. That's all the information I'm going to get on this particular document. So again, we've got to scavenge. We've got to look and see what else we can find on other records that will help us uh, fill in the blanks. Um, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and I'm just going to show you the other people uh, to save a bit of time because I know we're going to now run over uh, because of that little tech hit. So here are our four people called who work that I found in Griffith's valuation in Carlo. We just looked at the first man there who was renting a house in Lachlan Bridge Town. The second man was renting a corn mill and a kiln from someone called Francis Griffith in Knockbarra. The third man is renting 54 acres from a Reverend Charles M. Doyle. It's a house, offices, which just means outhouses, farm buildings and so on, and land in Knockbrack. Now, this is where it's important to have a map of Carlo beside me, because I need to know where those places are in Carlo. And Knockbrack and Knockbarra are actually right beside each other. These four places are all separate townlands. And so they might be different or the same people. And there's no way to tell for sure. If there were two Hugh Rourke's in the same townland and they were different men, there would be some form of differentiation on the record. It might give a, another person's name in brackets or it might say senior or, or something to show that they were different people. But if you see the same name appearing in a townland and there's no differentiation, then you can take it that it is the same individual. And this, of course, could have happened for many reasons, such as a man is renting some farmland over here. And then later on, there's an opportunity to rent another field in a different section of the townland. But he does that from a different person. And so they're not beside each other and they may be renting from different people, but it's actually the same guy who's renting them. In this case, I think it is very possible that the Hugh Rourke in Knockbrack and the Hugh Rourke in Knockbarra are the same man. And, and here's my reasoning. We've got a man who's renting 54 acres, which is a substantial holding. And maybe he's growing corn or something that needs to be milled. And so he's renting a corn mill in the adjacent townland uh, from someone else so that he can process what he is growing on his land. There's no way to be sure, totally sure from Griffith's valuation that it is the same man. The fourth man is another person who's renting just a house and he's renting in Bally Lane, which is actually down near the Kilkenny border with Carlo. So it's quite far away from from the other places that we've looked at. So how do I make an assessment of which you work is my person? Um, only one of them appears to be a farmer. Um, but I haven't seen my man be mentioned as farm. I've seen him listed as a labourer mainly. Um, so my answer is not a wholly satisfactory one. We've got four entries. They might not all be the same person. They might not all be different people. I think probably we've got three Hugh Works in Carlo on Griffith's valuation. We've got the guy in Lachlan Bridge, we've got the guy in Bally Ling, and we've got the man renting the, the acres and the corn mill in those two adjacent townlands. But it's also possible that my Hugh Work does not appear at all in these records. He was a farm labourer, so maybe he's working on someone else's land and not his own land. Maybe he is a daily labourer at the cottier class with no land of his own. And maybe he's um, living elsewhere and then going to work every day on the farm of someone else and, and coming home. So where do I go from here? How do I decide what to do? The next step is to look at the baptismal records for Carlo to see if we can identify Anne and her parents. And of course, we know at this stage that her parents are called Hugh and Esther. So we can hopefully triangulate between the three people and find them. When you're doing this sort of research, you also want to consider the names of the children in the next generation and look at their godparents in their own baptismal records, because they might be the siblings of the parents. It's very possible. And in this case, we know that Anne had 17 children and I have all of their names. And some of them did indeed have godparents whose surname was Rourke, which would suggest that they are Anne's siblings or cousins or somebody else who also came to live from Carlo into Dublin. But remember what I said about age as being really vague. Anne's age was very variable according to the records that we've looked at today. And if you look at this now, I've got a list of them for you to see. So I didn't show you earlier on, but when Anne died in 1920, it was reported that her age was 66, which makes 1854 as the target birth year. 
But when Anne was herself alive in 1911, she said she was 53, which would make 1858. And 10 years before that, she was apparently only 46, which makes 1855. And then in 1870, when she got married, she said precisely that she was 19. Um, and then the younger people are, the more likely they are to be right about their age. So that gives an approximate birth year of 1851. But if we look at what we've got assembled there, there's actually a seven year range that's possible. But when I look in the baptismal records of Carlo, I don't find an Anne Rourke in the 1850s, but I did find one in 1846. This image is a transcription which I've taken from Roots Ireland because it's just a nice, neat image to use here in the presentation. Um, but I did also look at the actual image to confirm that the transcription was right. That's always very important to make sure that the transcriber hasn't incorrectly put anything down. So what do we have here? We have Anne Rourke, that's the right name. We have parents called Hugh Rourke and Esther Walsh. So they are the right first names of the parents. We haven't up to now seen Esther's birth surname. So that's still a question mark over whether it's right. And these people are in Lachlanbridge Parish. And it's 1846, just before Christmas, that she's baptised. Um, now, it's also important to look at the address. And the baptismal records don't always give an address, but in this case they did, and it's just a townland, Rath Ellen. But Rath Ellen is right beside Rath Duff, which is where Anne said her parents lived when she got married in 1870. So this looks very promising, doesn't it? Now, I think it is the right person, but there are some problems with it, aren't there? They, it's 1846, and Anne has consistently said that she was born in the 1850s. So it's also possible here that what we have is an earlier child born to Hugh and Esther, who was called Anne, who didn't survive infancy. So it's very common in the past, if that happened, for a couple to choose the same name again when they had another baby of the same gender. It seems very strange by our modern standards today, but it is really very common in the 19th century. And right up until the middle of the 20th century, it did happen. So it may be that what I have here is a baptismal record for an earlier Anne in the family who didn't survive, and that the baptismal record for my Anne in the 1850s has also not survived. So it could be a merging of two people that I've got here. It's an outside chance, but it's probably more likely that Anne was just wrong about her age. Um, now, I didn't make this assessment just on the basis of this record. I also found other children in the Lachlan Bridge baptismal registers for Hugh and Esther, same uh, maiden name for Esther. And some of those children match the names of the godparents of Anne's children up in Dublin. So, for example, there was a Joanna Work who was one of the godparents of her children, and there was also a Joanna Work born to this couple in Lockton Bridge. So, this is my best assessment that this is Anne's baptismal record, and therefore I have now identified conclusively that Hugh and Esther were living in Rath Ellen in 1846. So, based on that, I'm able to say at the moment that the Hugh Work who lived in Lockton Bridge in 1852 and was renting a house from John Delaney is my ancestor. Now, I say my best assessment because we don't have all the facts. We don't have a time machine. And I may yet find something that changes my analysis later on. There might be an additional piece of information to be uncovered. or There might be a DNA link that leads me off in a different direction. But that is my analysis right now. Um, it's not a wholly satisfactory slam dunk answer, but that is typical of Irish genealogy. You're always making your best analysis, you're scavenging for all the different records and putting it together to build a picture. And it's like a jigsaw, we don't have the actual image that we're working from. So I hope that you've enjoyed my scavenger hunt come case study of how to use free Irish records today. There are some ways to contact me on the screen now. Um, now, obviously, this workshop has suffered from some technical issues when we were originally recording it. Um, the Zoom uh, account for Roots Tech failed a few times and we had to restart. And this uh, recording today has been stitched back together. And this last section has been re-recorded. Um, I hope it all makes sense for you, but please feel free to contact me on my socials if you have any follow-up questions. I'd be very happy to talk to you about them. We do have the chat from today saved, and I will be putting something up on my socials covering the main points that we didn't get to answer during the questions and answers section of the workshop today. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for taking the time to watch it. And um, 
I hope you've enjoyed Ruth Tech. Thanks, bye.